So a disease like myotonic dystrophy is, has variable and manifold manifestations of the eye and for vision. And the reason is, is that the unit of structure that we talk about, the eye and the orbit, has a wide variety of different tissues and structures in it, representative of many parts of the rest of the body. So it's very common with diseases to have an, an eye manifestation because there's so many diseases that affect other parts of the body that will affect that sort of tissue around the eye as well. Nevertheless, when it comes to a routine eye exam or a general eye doctor, you may find some discomfort uh, with a disease that is so rare and so systemic as myotonic dystrophy. And so the theme of, see, now we're not advancing there. There we go. So the theme of the talk is going to be how do you educate your doctor and thereby improve your care? So you come into a doctor's office, an eye doctor, you sit down, he says, do you have any medical problems? And the patient says, I have myotonic dystrophy. At that point, there's a couple of possibilities that's going to happen, OK? The first is you'll get this look <laughs> on your doctor's face, all right? Another possibility that you'll turn around, he'll be running out of the room screaming, and you'll never see him again, OK? So the point is, I want to help you help the doctor to help you. And when respectively conveyed, information can enable and empower the doctor to take care of a patient. Now, you have to remind the eye doctor about myotonic dystrophy, about your disease. You have to remind him to check for developing cataracts, to follow for lid drooping, to assess eyelid closure due to facial weakness, to look for corneal irritation from poor closure. We call that lag ophthalmus. To check eye pressure, because the eye pressure can be low in myotonic dystrophy. To check eye movement and the alignment of the eyes, which is called strabismus. To ask about double vision. To check the retina with dilation of the pupil in order to look for retinal changes to follow the retina with techniques, either an ERG, an electroretinogram, or an OCT, ocular coherence tomo tomography, and visual fields. And you also have to remind the doctor to ask and to look for the eye effects of some of the systemic effects of myotonic dystrophy. For instance, the cardiac effects can lead to strokes and emboli that can affect the eye and vision. The pulmonary effects can result in sleep apnea, which can result in lid laxity and ischemic optic neuropathy. The endocrine results of insulin uh, resistance can lead to diabetic retinopathy and pituitary tumors. It can be seen as an endocrine manifestation. Skin manifestations, you can get benign tumors called pilomatrixomas, which can be around the eye and cause eye problems. And maybe most of all, you have to remind the doctor about the anesthetic risks of a patient with myotonic dystrophy. Now, fortunately, most eye surgeries can be done under fairly minimal anesthesia these days. So those anesthesia risks become less and less significant for eye surgeries. So let's turn it around and Consider if you walked into a doctor's office with the symptoms and signs of a muscle disease, but you didn't have a diagnosis yet. For instance, facial weakness, ptosis, which is drooping of a lid, or limitation of eye movement. Okay, those are all common symptoms of myotonic dystrophy, which we'll see in a bit. But this patient here doesn't have myotonic dystrophy. This patient has chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. So when we think about facial weakness, ptosis, problems with eye movement, okay, we always have to ask the question, what's the differential diagnosis? That's 
how a good clinician thinks. He comes up with the pertinent problem and he comes up with the differential diagnosis, the list of things that can cause that problem, and then he proceeds down that list. That's how you know a clinician is a good clinician by the differential diagnosis that he's come up with. Okay? So what's the differential diagnosis of these sorts of presenting symptoms? And what's going through the doctor's mind when he sees someone with these sorts of symptoms? Well, sometimes what's going through the doctor's mind is something like this. But the differential diagnosis is actually uh, very precise, but also somewhat complicated. Uh, myasthenia gravis can present with those sorts of symptoms. Other neuromuscular junction diseases, such as botulism, organophosphate toxicity from insecticides, scorpion toxin, infiltrative diseases of the orbit or the muscles of the orbit or the cavernous sinus behind the eye, the part of the brain behind the eye, can present with those same sorts of symptoms. Uh, those can include tumors, inflammation, aneurysms, amyloid, lymphoma. We have to consider a family of diseases called mitochondrial myopathies, uh, such as chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia that I just showed you a picture of, or the kern sayer variant of that. And then there's dystrophic myopathies, of which myotonic dystrophy is one of them, uh, but uh, also includes other uh, diseases such as oculopharyngeal dystrophy. So you can see that it's a complex group of very different diseases that can present all with the same findings. And uh, the doctor then has to take that differential and work down the list and figure out what the patient has. And that's a very, that's a complex uh, phenomenon that a doctor has to do. This patient, for instance, has droopy lid. She looks over to the left, she can't move the eye. She looks to the right, she can't move the eye. She looks up, she can't move the eye. So she has ptosis, she has facial weakness, she has diminished extraocular motility. She doesn't have myotonic dystrophy, she has myasthenia. Now, the good news about myotonic dystrophy, and this is gonna be the take home message of the talk, is that the eye-related problems that arise with myotonic dystrophy are not unique and they can be routinely encountered and treated in the same way that a regular eye doctor encounters the similar situations with other diseases. So let's go through what a basic eye exam should be so that you all know what you should be looking for the doctor to do when you have an eye exam. <laughs> well, you have to have your visual acuity checked. You have to have the cranial nerves checked, that is, the nerves that connect the brain to the eye and to allow it to function. You have to have a slit lamp exam that allows you to look at the surface of the eye and then into the eye itself. And then you have to have a dilated exam so that you can look into the back of the eye, the retina and the optic nerve. So here's a slit lamp exam, a very uh, classic and old machine that has not really changed over many, many years. Still the workhorse of an eye exam. And what you see with the slit lamp, lamp exam is this column of light that allows you to see the lids, the ocular surface, the aqueous in the anterior chamber of the eye, and then back into the lens you can see the light illuminating an, an optical section of tissue. And you can see how if you put a little stain in the eye, you can see the blue light illuminating the green, which is the tear lake, so you can see how much tears are always present to lubricate the eye. So one of the manifestations of my, uh, myotonic dystrophy is cataract. So let's talk a little bit about cataract. It can present with symptoms of glare, Blurred vision, decreased contrast, myopic shift, that is, every year you go to the doctor, he gives you more and more nearsighted correction. There's a constant shift towards myopia, and that's because you're developing cataracts that's changing your refraction. It can also cause ghosting or doubling of the image. And a cataract is a yellowing or a discoloration of the lens inside of the eye. Now, the lens is 
the refractive, the focusing mechanism of the eye, just like the lens of a camera, it's important to keep in mind that the most powerful part of the refractive apparatus in the eye is not the lens, it's the cornea, it's the surface of the eye. So you can have a large cataract and not be bothered vis visually, but you can have the slightest little problem on the cornea and be quite miserable with your vision. So modern day cataract surgery is a very technically pristine and commonly performed procedure. And it has to do with going into the eye with a little suction device, removing the lens, and then placing a clear intraocular lens in its place. Done thousands and thousands of times every day in the world. And the classic textbook cataract that occurs in myotonic dystrophy is called a polychromatic or a Christmas tree cataract and looks like this. You see little tiny colorful crystals shining back at you when you look into the eye. It's actually quite beautiful. So this is the textbook cataract, but a myotonic dystrophy patient can have any form of cataract in their eye. And the cataract is addressed in exactly the same way as any cataract would in any patient. No difference whatsoever. So um, in my attempt to try to show you what a cataract surgery looks like, we put a couple of videos, none of which worked, <laughs> which shows you how technically sophisticated we are. Um, we can do it, but we can't film it. Uh, but we'll try. And the reason it's worth seeing is because it truly is a very interesting surgery uh, to see. Um, so we'll give it a try here. And I'm going to narrate it, and then I'm going to try to fast forward it, because we don't have to watch the whole thing. Although a typical cataract surgery actually doesn't take all that long. This is the eye under a microscope. Uh, this is the surgeon with a little Q-tip. He's injected some, uh, some substance into the eye. You'll see a little uh, needle go in just a second in order to help protect the cornea and separate the cornea from the lens itself. He's going to squirt a little bit with, with water. And then he's going to take a little instrument and peel off the front membrane of the lens so that he can remove the lens itself. You can see he's injecting some medicine there. It's not some medicine, some, some substance to protect the surface, the back surface of the cornea. And he's going to use a little hook. And he's going to pull off that membrane. That's the front surface, the front capsule of the lens. There's a back capsule as well, by the way, uh, because the lens is essentially uh, a piece of tissue in a sack, in a bag. The back uh, capsule is, is left there, and the intraocular lens he's going to put on gets placed against that, so it's supported. And some people talk about having a second cataract or a recurrence of a cataract well, once you take the lens out, you don't have, you can't have another cataract. That's, that's the, it's taken care of for good. But that back capsule can become clouded sometimes, and the doctor sometimes has to come back with a laser to get rid of that to clear the vision. That's what people sometimes mistakenly call a second cataract. So, with great trepidation, I'm going to try to fast forward. I'm going to do it. We're going to do it this time, just so they can see how the lens substance is sucked out. You can see the pieces being taken from the inside of the eye. The video that I wish I could show you, just for a dramatic effect, is the use of the laser now to assist with this procedure, where the laser comes right on top of the cornea. And you can see in the video the cataract essentially being pulverized by the laser, in which case the surgeon really just has to go in with a little suction and suck it out. It's pretty dramatic. So you can see he's removing all the little fragments. 
And then we'll try one more time. Once he's uh, removed all those little pieces. He's going to come with a folded intraocular lens. You're going to stick it through that little hole. And it's going to unfold in the eye. He's going to center it a little bit. And now the patient has a new intraocular lens and clear vision. There you go. Now he sucks all the uh, fluid out there and then just make sure that the lens is well positioned because once he finishes, you don't want to have to touch it again. And it rests on the back membrane of the eye of the lens. Good. We'll skip the, uh, I won't torture with my attempt to make them work. So let's get to another manifestation of myotonic dystrophy, weakness. So facial weakness causes difficulty with closing your eye, because that requires muscles, okay? And that will present with symptoms of dry and irritated eyes from the exposure of the cornea that's not being blinked and the tear film's not lubricating it, okay? Or facial weakness can present with problems of drooping of lids because you don't have the muscle strength to lift your lids and that will have symptoms of blocked vision or fatigue and sleepiness because your eyes are closed. So let's first deal with dry and irritated eyes from corneal exposure, okay? You can see in this uh, patient She's trying to close her eyes, but the eyes are not getting closed. Okay, that's called lag ophthalmos, and that leads to exposure of the corneas and irritation. But that can be seen in any disease that has weakness of facial muscles, either bilateral or unilateral. There's facial nerve palsies called Bell's palsies, which are very, very common and have the same sorts of issues associated. And there's also diseases and problems that you can have restriction or scarring of the tissue around the eye, which can prevent you from closing your eyes normally. So here's a very typical case that an eye doctor would see. Lag ophthalmos, he can't completely close his eye. He's trying, right? That's because he has a unilateral facial nerve palsy or a Bell's palsy. You can see his smile is asymmetric because there's weakness on this side. You should be able to close your eyes and not allow anyone to open it. You have the mechanism from evolution to protect your eyes to that extent. So you can see here I can not open this woman's eye on the left, but on the right I can because she has unilateral facial weakness. You shouldn't be able to do that with somebody. Here's another case of unilateral lag ophthalmos corneal exposure and irritation. You can see on a slit lamp exam how the fluorescein stains the areas where the cornea is irritated. Here's another case. You can see from uh, the picture, she can't close her right eye, and you can see that how the slit lamp exam shows all this corneal staining. Here you have little punctate drying and stippling of the cornea because of dryness due to lag ophthalmos. Here's one last case. You can see how just Walking in the room, the fluorescein lights up the areas where the cornea is, is stained. You can make that diagnosis from across the room. Now, in addition to being able to close your eyes tight, we are endowed with the uh, reflex that your eyes go up under your closed eye in order to protect your eye. So a lot of mechanisms are built in over evolution to protect our eyes and keep them uh, lubricated. So you can imagine if you have a problem with 
extraocular muscles, you can't move your eyes, you're not going to have this protective mechanism either. So you're not only not going to be able to close your eye, but you're not going to be able to move your eyes out of the way. That's called a Bell's phenomenon, and that perhaps would be missing in someone who can't move their eyes because of myotonic dystrophy. So what's the mainstay treatment for patients who have exposure problems? And this is not just for myotonic dystrophy. This is for uh, diseases that any eye doctor sees routinely, okay? Well, artificial tear drops, gels, and ointments, many, many different varieties over the counter. And typically, we'll use ocular drops, okay, during the day, sometimes frequently, sometimes every hour, sometimes every 15 minutes, just to re-wet the surface of the eye. And then you'll use the thicker gels when you really are having symptoms, and you'll tend to use the ointment at nighttime because it's going to blur your vision. You'll put some in and protect your eye when you're asleep because then it doesn't matter if, if it's blurred. The lacrimal system. Recall the uh, tears are made up here in the lacrimal gland, but they flow across the eye and then they go out through your tear ducts. So we can take little plugs and put them in the tear duct here and prevent the tears from leaving the eye so that you can use your tears to a greater advantage and keep the eye lubricated. And those are very easy to do in an office. And when you can't move your face, when you have facial weakness, your eyelids, which are suspended across the the eye can tend to rotate either outward causing ectropion or inward causing entropion where it starts irritating your eye because the lashes are now pointing the wrong way. And we treat this with lubrication. What we also sometimes do resuspension or repositioning surgery in order to get the lid into a correct position. This is a classic example of something you give no thought to all your life because you're doing fine. You never think about where your eyelid is positioned, but when it doesn't work right, just like any minute part of the body, if it's not working and doing what it's supposed to be doing, it causes a problem that becomes significant. So now let's get to the other part of facial weakness, and which would be drooping of the eyelids. Of course, you can have it on just one eye alone, or you can have bilateral drooping. Here's an example, again, of unilateral drooping. Here's an example of bilateral lid drooping called ptosis. Typically in myotonic dystrophy, it's a symmetric disease, but not always. And if your lids are drooping, sometimes you'll take a chin up, head back posture because you're trying to look underneath your droopy lid. So frequently you'll see people, especially children, walk around like that. And those patients can present with symptoms of neck pain. And they'll go to an orthopedic surgeon, and they'll be worked up by a physical therapist, and no one will notice that the reason the neck is hurting is because the patient's walking around with their head turned back. Similarly, people who have droopy lids tend to use their foreheads to try to lift their eyelids, and they'll present with headaches or eye strain or just plain old fatigue from having to do that constantly. And no one will realize that it's because they're trying to lift their lids. Now, Ptosis, or drooping of the lid from a muscle problem, is not to be confused with dermatocalasis, which is excess upper lid skin that's hooding over the lid, okay? So for instance, on this patient, you might say, oh, that looks like a droopy lid on that side, but if you lift his brow, the skin gets pulled out of the way, you, you see that the lid is actually in a normal position. So dermatocalasis is treated with a surgery called a blepharoplasty, where we remove the skin, okay? And that's what people commonly refer to when they say they're having their eyes done or a cosmetic surgeon is saying, uh, I did a lid lift. But that's different than TOSA surgery, which is actually tightening the muscle. You can also have mechanical causes of drooping lids. We talked about the benign skin tumor the pilomatrix soma that can occur in myotonic dystrophy, well, that can occur around the eye, and the sheer weight of a tumor like that can make the lid droop, and these can be removed uh, surgically. So how do we treat ptosis? Well, there are such things as lid crutches, which are little extensions that can be put on glasses, which simply mechanically push the lid up. 
And so you wear, you wear these, it pushes your lid up, it holds it up in the air, or it holds it up above your eye, and then you blink and it comes down and it catches your eye again and pushes the lid up. But there are also surgical approaches to adjusting lid height. One can do an external approach where you make an incision in the upper lid, you find the muscle, and you simply tighten it and reattach it to the lid so that it pulls stronger. Or alternatively, you can flip the eyelid over and do it from the internal approach. Similarly, these are all very, very standard surgical procedures that are done for a variety of different problems. Now, if the muscle doesn't work, tightening it's not going to lift it. So you have to look for an alternative way to lift the muscle. And another third frequently used surgical procedure is to do what's called a frontalis sling procedure, where you'll take a silicon uh, thread, attach it into the lid here, and then bring it up over the brow and tie it so that when the patient lifts their brows, the lid will come up with it. The take-home message with about TOSA surgery is it's always a balancing act. If the lid is too low, you're still going to have your vision being blocked by the lid. But if you raise the lid too high, then the eye is going to get very dry from exposure. So you have to constantly be trying to assess where you need to put the lid to make it good enough to see and look good, but also not too high to cause exposure changes. And that's a difficult thing to assess, and sometimes you have to go back and readjust it on patients. But just to show you what a difference TOSA surgery can make in people, here's a couple of examples. You can start with bilateral drooping, and then postoperatively, he can see again. Similarly here is unilateral TOSA surgery. After surgery, both lids are up. Preoperative again, patient looks like that. Postoperative, lid is up. Here's a child with unilateral ptosis, and then postoperatively, the lid is up again. Lastly, here's pretty significant drooping, and she's using her brows to pull up her eyelid. Eyelids are up now, and she can see. Now, if the disease affects the eye muscles, the muscles that move the eye, okay, if, if it affects them asymmetrically, as often happens in certain diseases, you're going to have double vision because your eyes are going to be looking in different directions. Okay, and that's called diplopia, or double vision. That rarely happens in myotonic dystrophy because it's usually a symmetric disease. So although a patient can't move their eye, they can't move it the same amount in any direction, and so they have single vision. They just can't move their eye as well. But if one does have double vision, then what we do is we put prisms in glasses. A prism simply takes the image from the two eyes and bends them so they come together so that the, the brain is seeing one image. Sometimes we do what's called eye muscle surgery, which is tightening an eye muscle in the same way that we would tighten a lid muscle. Uh, since it's a symmetric disease, that's not as common in myotonic dystrophy as it is in many other diseases. Eye muscle surgery is a very routine surgery done, especially on children who are born with crossed eyes. And lastly, the dilated eye exam. Uh, when you dilate the eyes and you look back, you get a panoramic view of the optic nerve, the macula, the vessels. You can see why people go into ophthalmology, because the visual ability to see different parts of, of the eye, to see different tissues, to see different parts, for instance, when you're looking at the optic nerve, that's the only part of the brain that you can actually see. When you're looking at vessels, those are the only vessels in the body that you can actually look and see blood flowing through. So it's quite fascinating to be able to make diagnoses with the eye, because you're looking at the disease itself. So we do dilated funnus exams in patients with myotonic dystrophy because we're looking for pigmented retinopathies that can occur um, in patients with that disease. It's not uh, that common, but it certainly happens. And uh, 
in this day and age, there are a number of technologies which have helped us in making those diagnoses. Uh, ocular coherence tomography is actually a way of optically looking into the back of the eye and looking at each layer in the retina. The resolution is that good that you can see the, cell, the different cellular layers of the retina and you can follow somebody with diseases of the retina very effectively that way. So, in conclusion, this information is to help you help your doctor, okay? Because if they're reminded of the issues that come up with myotonic dystrophy, then they can use that information to follow you. And the real take-home message is that although the disease may be complicated, the eye-related problems can be addressed in very routine ways by either ophthalmologists or optometrists. And so it doesn't have to be the mystery or the concern on the part of the doctor, but it does require very vigilant eye exams uh, routinely, at least yearly. Good. Well, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Yes. It would be a very technical and individualized decision. Um, with some trepidation, I'll make a statement that will now be broadcast around the world, and I'll probably, <laughs> this may be the last time you see me. <laughs> I should probably say goodbye to my family, because there'll be some ophthalmologists that will try to get me. Um, there's enough variability with the new multifocal lenses that uh, one might think twice and a third time before implanting them in a patient who has a disease that has other things that that patient's going to have to be worried about. If you're perfectly healthy and you really don't want to wear reading glasses and you're so vain, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying this about you, I'll get to you in a second, um, then one could make a case for weathering the potential, although rare, um, issues that occur with these multifocal lenses, okay? Uh, but there is a uh, not insignificant group of patients who get these that have less than optimal results. The optimal result meaning you don't have to wear reading glasses and you can see distance as well. It's so tempting. The problem is if you have other diseases or other potential problems with one's body or one's eye, uh, you may be just asking for another issue, and it sounds, unfortunately, like that might be what you're going with. On the other hand, um, I actually, I, of course, I don't know the doctor that did this, but I have no doubt that uh, anyone putting in a multifocal lens is doing it with some concern and care, so it's not a haphazard decision that people make. Um, and it may have actually been a very reasonable thing to try. Unfortunately, there are other equally technical resolutions to some of those problems as well. Uh, so I, I think all I can leave you is with the confidence that there are things that he can do to help with that issue. Um, and it, would, it really depends on a lot of very individual and technical issues to decide what's best for you. Um, I will first give you the party line. The party line is that as a physician, I really can only recommend something that has been clinically proven to be true. And there is, in fact, good, solid evidence to show that vision therapy has no useful effect. So it's not that it's never been proven to be clinical fairly strong scientific data to show that it isn't effective in, in certain instances that it's being used in. Now, that being said, um, if I had a child with a problem, it would be hard not to offer my child anything that I thought might help. <laughs> uh, but that's a dangerous position to take. Uh, because that could 
that could eat up resources that would be used in a more useful way. And it also uh, unleashes so many possibilities that you wouldn't know where to go. So at this point, I don't think I would recommend vision therapy for the particular problems that the cognitive and sensory issues uh, occur with uh, myotonic dystrophy or something like that. Because the whole notion of sensory integration actually in the scientific community is, is in a high degree of question. No, atropine is not dangerous. Um, I haven't used atropine since this morning when I did it to my son. Um, so I'm experiencing the same issues on a daily basis, and it's, it's difficult, and you do the best you can. Um, and I always carry a patch in my pocket, and we try to do the atropine, and it is, it is difficult. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, of course, you always want to make sure, as your doctor would, that it's the right prescription, because frequently, if it's the right prescription, it'll be so clear to a, a child, just like it would be to an adult, that they'll, they'll want to wear them. But it's the notion of wearing glasses, which um, some do and some don't get used to. It, it is a problem. It is a problem. There's no simple answer to that, unfortunately. And I speak, as you can see, from personal experience as well as from being a doctor. <laughs> well, then come to my house and take care of myself. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes? The beauty of most eye procedures is that they can frequently be done under topical anesthesia with simply drops to anesthetize the eye. That's quite a revolution. Uh, so cataract surgery today is done routinely with topical anesthesia exclusively. So there are no side effects that you would have to be worried about. Um, a patient may have a Valium before the procedure. Sometimes uh, they will be given some intravenous sedation so that some local anesthesia can be given around the eye. Um, in truth, with enough patience and time and care, that could even be done without the intravenous. Nowadays, uh, that's done simply because it's more comfortable to kind of sedate a patient, but that's not essential. Rarely do you put someone to sleep for a cataract surgery. Um, in my group of 15, ophthalmologists and eye doctors. I'm the only one who goes to a hospital because of what I do, but they all do these in outpatient surgery centers where anesthesia is, is uh, not given you know, as a general anesthesia. Um, the reasons you might have to put someone under general anesthesia is that they aren't able to be calm and sit quietly while this is happening. That's actually not that common. I mean, and someone with severe cognitive impairment would have difficulty understanding what's going on and might be agitated. Um, even then, intravenous anesthesia may suffice without putting someone to sleep. So I, I don't think in this day and age the anesthesia concern should be the utmost concern with respect to cataract surgery, and it would be a shame with all of the issues that can occur in a systemic disease uh, to not put oneself, to not avail oneself to uh, something that can cause such profound improvement in their overall condition uh, with relatively little risk. Uh, every surgery has risks. You should never, never accept a statement that this is easy or this is trivial, all right? I mean, no surgery is easy or trivial. But uh, you can accept the statement that relative risk of something like cataract surgery is pretty low. Uh, no, they aren't more common than in the general population. <laughs> uh, but there's nothing about myotonic dystrophy that protects you from an epiretinal membrane. And the, 
the risk factors for epiretinal membranes, uh, one of which is intraocular surgery certainly is present if you've had cataract surgery. Say that again. That you had the epiretinal membrane first, and then you, well, they weren't related in that way, but you happened to have both of them. Correct, yeah. The indications are identical. When it degrades your vision and is causing problems, then that's a reasonable time to do it. No, there's, there's no such thing as a prophylactic, get it done now because this is a, because there's a sale or something like that. Yeah. All right. Well, when he says it's time to go, <laughs> we should go. But I will stand over here. I'm not going anywhere. So I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you.